Robert Morris even had the audacity, the nerve to actually quote the scripture and say that God is not mocked. My name is Trey Wilbanks, and I'm here to speak to you on behalf of the Gateway Elders. I really wish that I could sit down with each one of you individually and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Standing before you right now may be the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. So I ask for your grace as I speak to you today, because I'm going to speak to you personally, as a father, as a husband, and a non-staff elder since 2014. I'm gonna to try to speak to you from my heart today, so I wrote my thoughts down to make sure I say exactly what I want to say. My wife, Shelly, and I have seven children, including six girls. As a father, what has happened is extremely disturbing, and I'm experiencing a wide range of emotions like you. As an elder, I did not know the truth. And frankly, like so many of you, my wife and I are shocked, devastated, and grieving. Firstly, I'd like to express my personal compassion for Cindy Clemenshire. I can't imagine carrying a burden like that for so many years. And I want to say to you, Cindy, I'm so sorry. I'm also very sensitive to anyone else in this room or anyone who is listening who's experienced abuse. I know that there are many in this room, at our other campuses, and many watching online who have their own horrific abuse story. And I want to speak to you. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. I cannot imagine the pain and the emotions that this past week has stirred inside of you as you felt betrayed. And on behalf of the elders, we're sorry. This past week, the Board of Elders accepted the resignation of our senior pastor, Robert Morris. Our tagline at Gateway Church is, we're all about people. And you can't be all about people if you aren't committed to protecting people. We are committed to protecting people. First and foremost, children and the most vulnerable. Simply put, abuse in any form cannot be tolerated. And we as elders have the responsibility to do whatever it takes to learn the truth. And I want you to know that as your elders, we are deeply committed to walking in integrity and finding the truth. We moved quickly this week to hire an independent outside law firm to conduct a comprehensive and independent inquiry into this entire situation. The elders and you must know the facts and we must enforce accountability. Having this review completed by an independent outside organization is critical and we will report back to you once their work is complete. And please know that the Board of Elders is fully cooperating with this independent work which has already begun. And I ask that we all be patient while we give them time to do their work. I know that they... All right, y'all. So that is the one of the elders from Gateway Church. And he has made this statement. Of course, they had to say something. They, there's no way that they couldn't have said anything. And, and uh, they had to say something with the amount of attention that uh, this story has garnered from the media and the public. They had to say something. And um, so far, I mean, there's general, you know, people feel different ways about the statement. Um, initial thoughts on that statement right there? Yeah, to... The, the statement, whatever he said, uh, I think he was contrite. He sounded very remorseful and very believable. I just wish this was at the bare minimum if it was the senior pastor issuing this statement, mm, okay? Mm. Which happens to be uh, James Morris, 
who is the son of uh, Robert Morris. So maybe if he had come in, like, yes, I'm a senior pastor of this church, whatever is happening for good or bad, we take responsibility. Right now, my father cannot be here on this stage, as you know, he, he resigned, but I am speaking on behalf of this congregation just to assure the audience, to assure their congregation. I think you would have carried weight given James Morris being the son. Uh, being the son. I also do think that uh, Robert Morris, I'm sure he would love to say something, but I'm sure his lawyers must have already advised him that you better keep quiet. You better keep quiet. Mm. So that is a legal advice that the lawyers are going to advise. So I don't... Um, expect any statement from him, which I also assume that the son might not even be able to make any statement because if he makes a statement uh, in the legal terms, be like, okay, that's the son. He's speaking on behalf of the, uh, of the dad. So I think legally wise, they've decided not to speak. Let the elders of the church speak because if somebody's suing, they will either be suing the church. You know what I'm saying? So it's unfortunate, this idea that now they are hiring uh, outside counsel. I am not an advocate of hiring outside law firms to come in and investigate things. I don't think that's, there's no need for that. If anything, you report the issue to the police, let the police handle it. But given this issue has, it, it, the statute of limitation has passed, I think they should have just, just let it go. You don't want to have outside influence how the church is handled because they do things different they don't do things like we do so that would be my only uh caution about that yeah no i think that's a really good point that why was a statement not made by the senior pastor who is the son mm -hmm. and it doesn't look good of course he wants to distance himself from the story maybe him maybe there's a a, a thought that if he makes the statement it's going to be a bit of a distraction as well that because it's coming from him, it might be a distraction. But if we're dealing with just the church itself, mm. forget about the public perception, just based on the church itself, it would make the most sense if the senior pastor makes that statement because it is such an important thing for the church to speak about and to know about, mm. you know. And, yeah. and I'm with you, I think, as far as the... Um, independent investigations and stuff. I'm with you on that. I think that there is, you know, I understand why they're doing it. I don't think it's it's necessary, but I understand why they're doing it because at this point they want to, there's already, they dropped the ball in so, ma in so many other areas and there's so many things that were not done correctly as far as, you know, their lack of knowledge of Robert Morris's uh, affairs, the things that he was doing. Mm. And so at this point, it's like, okay, let's just come back and do this massive correction, even if it looks like overcorrection by getting an outside firm and doing all these things. They just want to look like they have made every effort to right the wrongs that have been done. Yes, yeah, absolutely. At this point, I, everybody knows about it. I do believe that they were misled because remember initially these elders didn't want to say anything about it. If anything, they were giving the public the talking points that they've always done. Like, oh no, remember this story that uh, the pastor has already talked about throughout the years that you've guys you've been here. But what he omitted was the age of the so-called the young girl. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because I don't think he would have wanted, he knew what he was hiding. He didn't want to showcase to people that, oh, okay, this quote-unquote young lady was 12 years old. So at this point, there's no denying these issues happened as we show you uh, more stuff that has come out uh, publicly. Yeah, so it is a lot. I mean, there's um, some good comments here. Uh, Rebecca says, unfortunately, in a lot of these churches, all it takes is someone who's a charismatic, well-spoken leader who can bring in the people. Absolutely. It is a product that these churches are putting forth. Right. So it's the the church growth movement mm -hmm. just says, follow these certain things, follow this model, have a, a leader that is a, a great communicator and he is, is charismatic, um, you know, and do all those things and you can grow your church. Yeah. And there seems to be not enough emphasis on doing the actual due diligence to check that this person's character mm. is in line. Forget the doctrine. I mean, just the character is often something that is 
highly questionable when things start to come out. I mean, look at there's guys like Rod Parsley, who we heard about recently yelling at people. I mean, yes. there's things where it's like, I mean, Mark Driscoll yeah. is doing his thing. So it's like even just the character of some of these men is, yes, you're trying to follow this model to build your church. But at the end of the day, you're totally overlooking things that are clear in Scripture as the qualifications in terms of character of the person who's supposed to be leading the church. Yeah, absolutely. And besides, the the qualifications of an elder, what do they deal with? They deal with the character of an elder. So because these people have questionable characters, they do not deserve to hold the office. But because they are so charismatic, we forgo what the scripture clearly states, what an elder should be. So he, that's why we're here 35 years later in this situation. We're not... Uh, taking our lessons seriously from the scriptures. So now they just put all the churches in one basket, like, oh, this is what happened in the churches. This is what happened in churches. You think the outside world are going to make a distinction that, uh, no, these guys are this, these guys are this. Like, no, we are all in one, like the evangelicals. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's they broad brush everybody. Of you course, know? Like you just, and you, you cannot just blame them, it. to be quite honest, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, they, we just get broad brush. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Shout, shout out to Tammy. Kyle in the building. Thanks for coming through. Good to see you, brother. Tim, Tim Moore, thanks for coming through. Good to see you. And we see, yeah, brother Alton was in the building as well. I think I saw him there. Yeah, Alton is in there. Yeah, there we mm -hmm. go. There we go. Shout out to Alton in the building. Grace and peace, brother. Of course, Grace and peace. Hugh Shaw is in the building. Lady Kiana from Sweet Home, Alabama. Yeah. And Sweet Diane home. Catalano, good, good, good to see you. Good to see you, good to DC. See you all. Good to nice. see you all. So let's um, move on to another th thing that happened over the weekend at, at Gateway Church, and that was the fact that there were people actually protesting. Yes. <laughs> people protested outside the church, and we're just going to go ahead and not even going to, you know, not going to delay too much. I'll bring you up and... Uh, just play this for y'all, okay? And then we'll come back on the other end. It's a short clip. Right, right now, protesters are rallying outside Gateway Church in South Lake after a scandal rocked that congregation and community. The demonstrators are calling attention to Pastor Robert Morris's resignation over allegations he molested a 12-year-old girl decades ago. The victim says the abuse happened in the 1980s, but she just came forward with her story. And her supporters rallied outside Gateway this afternoon, urging any other potential victims to come forward. There's no time frame on when is the right time for a victim to tell their story. We all grieve differently. Some grieve right away and want to tell right away, and some don't. So she has done nothing wrong. Now, as people were protesting outside, Gateway was holding its regular Saturday evening service, and during that service, an elder addressed the issue. And I want to speak to you. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. I cannot imagine the pain and the emotions that this past week has stirred inside of you as you felt betrayed. And on behalf of the elders, we're sorry. So that is the news clip showing the protests that took place out there. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty pretty wild that they had these uh, protests going on there, but it's to be expected. To be expected that this would have occurred out there. Um, I do find this the, the statement that one of the the lady who they asked uh, said interesting when she said there is no. Because this question keeps coming up, right? It's like, okay, why 30 years later? Why so long? Why 35 years later? Why are we talking about this now? Why is this case coming up? And the lady said that there is no time limit for somebody to to come forth and uh, essentially tell their story and, and, and uh, reveal things that, that may have happened to them. And, you know, in that, I would say I agree. I, I agree that I, I think that it may have taken a long time for us to hear about it because that's the other part. It's not like these things were um, hidden to certain parties, right? But we get to hear about it late, so late, so much decades later because th there was a cover-up. Because it was because of the cover-up we get to hear about it decades later. It's not like she never spoke about it. But, um, yeah, I found that interesting. And I, and I do think, um, in a sense, there is um, 
look, there's the biblical precedent that, I mean, like sin is sin, right? So you're going to pay for that sin, you know, at some point, right? You're going to pay for that sin at some point. And, and if, if you're not in Christ, then you have to, you know, you're going to pay for that no matter what you did, no matter when you did it, when the time comes for you to be just for that mm-hmm. thing, you're going to be just for it. And so if that's the case, then I think that it's it's well and good for somebody to come forth, uh, no matter how long it's been, if it's now a burden to them to say, you know what, I need to tell this story. Yeah. Uh, my thing to me would be, I think it's good to encourage people to share that as soon as possible, to bring it to attention as soon as possible. Because we know like people don't want to say something because they're thinking if they say something, nobody's going to believe them. If they say something, they might be ashamed. That's that's why they don't want to bring it up. But if we create environment, the culture where we we are sharing these things, right? Like because we are to confess our sins to one another. We are to share each other's burdens. This can foster um, an environment where these things can be found out quickly because we know, right, there will be a statute of limitation that's going to expire. So the sooner you come out, the sooner you can get help, the sooner that person is going to be found. That way he's not going to do that to other people because, like, for 35 years, right, everybody's questioning, was this the only incident? You see what I'm saying? But if the sooner the person is found, the sooner the person is, quote, unquote, locked up, they face their charges, you know, they have no time to be doing all those things. We understand if people want to sin, they'll find ways to sin. But we need to be encouraging these things like page the evil among you. Mm. And then this idea of, quote, unquote, this tradition that we have created, restoration. So this guy was restored to an office of an elder. I mean, we all trust our pastors. You see what I'm saying? So now he's being trusted with that office and this is the damage that this guy was done, right? Because, quote unquote, he was restored back to uh, back to the ministry. Like, oh, he saved his two years, whatever the case may be. Like, no, you violated that office. You have to go. Okay, you have to go. There are so many other men who can fulfill uh, that particular pulpit. Like, why should we be, be holding to one person simply because they are charismatic or whatever the case may be? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. I agree. I think the environment of people being able to speak up, making it a uh, a place where people feel comfortable telling uh, somebody what's yes. going like there being people in people's lives where they know that I can go to this person no matter how difficult it is I can go to them you know kids mm-hmm. have to have that in their parents yes. right? they have to have that in their parents mm-hmm. um, even they even having peers who are like that where it's like and, and in this case that seems to be what happened where Cindy told somebody and that somebody took it to the parents so it wasn't yeah. even her parents who actually knew about it like for the first hand information so they also found out via someone else telling them and of course that was a shock and uh, a horror to them but but having people who you can turn to is it's vital man. yes absolutely building those relationships plus uh robert morris actually telegraphed with his own words that he was intentionally specifically looking for young ladies who didn't have a good relationship with their father so uh, you know, he was actually hunting these these young people. So this guy, man, he, he it was up to no good, and he actually, you know, shared this himself. So yeah, we are our brother's keeper, right? Keep an eye out, and when the charges come in, you wanna do due diligence, investigate things properly in the way that in the way that is biblical. We don't want to encourage people to come in say things that are not true, right? But we also don't want to suppress people when they come out and say something. Amen to that. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, There's a question from Mark Pinsky. Yes. Uh, greetings to Mark in the chat. And Mark asks a question. Do you think the Gateway Elders will allow Robert Morrison's Robert Morris's son to take over? <laughs> he's yeah. already taken over. Yeah, he's already taken over. <laughs> the, the dad handed the keys to the son, yeah, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is he's it. now the senior pastor, including his wife, his wife. So James Morris is associate senior pastor of Gateway Bible Church. And uh, the wife to James Morris, Debbie, is also executive senior pastor. That has already been done. Unless if the elders decide to change that, but what would be the charge for them be removing the son? Because you cannot, you know, punish the son for the sins of the father. That's not uh, uh, biblical. Yeah, so just a quick look at their website here once again. There's James there. 
Um, there's yeah. Bridget, Bridget there. That's the wife. And I mean, yes, you, you, you don't even need to say it. Why is Bridget a pastor? <laughs> exactly. right? Why is Bridget a pastor? That's already huge red flags there. Um, what's interesting is I didn't see that gentleman who made the actual announcement on this list of elders. And as you can see, there's a lot of pastors here, yeah. right? We're ca- These are just rows and rows and rows of uh, people that work there. And um, yeah, so I didn't see that see. gentleman there, or yeah. maybe yeah, careers. Elder. But no. there was another guy who spoke at the end. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, he's uh, the black gentleman over there. He's one of the elders there. This he one? spoke at the end. No, further up, this one came to yes, yeah. Okay. He, he he also spoke. Kemp out Glasgow mm-hmm. also spoke. Uh, we'll see if we return to that video or not. It's pretty long, but we'll definitely try to leave the link in the description for you guys to check out as well. Um, yeah, no, but great question. Great question. I think that, uh, the structure just has it so that there's no way out of that thing where he he is going to be, um, he's definitely going to be the, uh, the pastor and no one says anything about that. Uh, shout out to Marie. Thanks for joining us. One of the elders did talk about it today. Um, there we have it. Yep. Uh, Rebecca made a good statement here. Sadly, the secular world does a better job investigating <laughs> stuff like this than the church. It should never be. And and you are good 100%. Good point, Rebecca. It should never mm. be that the church is lagging behind and creating these uh, almost like harboring, you know, fugitives, right? You're harboring fugitives or harboring people who are uh, with, with, with bad intent, with, with bad, uh, you know, deeds, and you're harboring them and covering them up. And, and mm-hmm. we're seeing this pattern way too much. We're seeing this pattern way too much. And obviously, just looking at this website, seeing how many people <laughs> have to keep their jobs, <laughs> you understand why it's like churches do bad stuff. I'm not saying that they did everything bad in this case, but just as an example, that these churches, um, that might even be part of it, to be honest with you, where you're dealing with this mm-hmm. mega church culture mm-hmm. and it's like massive, right? There's massive uh, amounts of money involved and people need to uh, pr- protect their jobs. And sadly, that's what they do. And it's terrible. Yeah, I do think when it comes to the church, this is my opinion, what I'm suspecting as to the reason why they fail to do a good job. It's this idea. Is that what? First Corinthians 6, where it tells like, if your brother wrongs you, right, just sort it out between you two. Don't bother to be taking your brother to the court. Yeah. So I think that's just a misunderstanding of misapplication of that scripture. If it's just something that... Uh, you know, we wrong each other. Those are the things you can take care in house. But when if it's something that's criminal, that belongs to the government, right? So the government is the one that exercises the sword, not the church. That's when you can report that you can forgive your brother. The person can get church discipline, but that does not mean you don't get the authorities involved. Especially when something has to do, uh, if something is criminal, that needs to be reported because at that point, it's no longer the jurisdiction of the church, but it's the jurisdiction of the state, which is a government, right? The government is God's deacon. So just having the church to understand there's a role where the government plays, the family and the church. And yeah, so because to them, be like, okay, he repented, he confessed, he was restored, case closed. But that's not how things work. Absolutely not. No, absolutely, absolutely not. And it's, it's a misapplication of that verse. I, I mean, clearly, man, I mean, this is this is a criminal thing. The person has committed something criminal that is now outside of the, the walls of the church. Mm. And that, yeah, the state has to deal with that. The government absolutely has to deal with that. Hello, I'm James Robinson, and this is my wife, Betty. I'm the founder of Life Outreach International and Life Today Television. Last week, Reports surfaced that Pastor Robert Morris Gateway Church had engaged in sexual assault of a child. Since then, people have been asking questions about my relationship with Robert. I'd like to set the record straight because some people are claiming that I was present when Robert met with the victim's family in 1987 and that I knew the girl's age when these events took place. This is false. It is not so. It is, in fact, a lie. The victim herself corrected the record after the initial news report came out, letting it be known that I, in fact, wasn't there. And I have a statement here in my hand from her attorney. 
Cindy's attorney, attesting to the fact that I was not present at any of the meetings between Robert and the victim's family. In fact, I did not become aware of the girl's age until the news broke last week. I was stunned. I was aware that Robert had had moral failure in his past, but I had no idea it was a crime involving a child. This is totally unacceptable. The way Robert handled it was absolutely incorrect. It was wrong. Abuse of a child should not be tolerated. I would do anything to help heal Cindy and her family. Betty and I are praying for everyone who's been hurt by these terrible events. Yeah, I agree with you, James. Our hearts are broken. What words are adequate? to say anything comforting in a situation like this, except we pray for all of those involved. Join with us, I hope you will, seriously. And let's pray and ask God to heal the hurt and the pain that's been there for so long. God bless you. So this email, uh, this is Cindy sending this email to Robert Morris. And I quote, men that have over 100 counts of child Dash, go to prison. Men who pastor churches that have over 100 counts of children go to prison and pay punitive damages. Okay. You have not had to do either. I do not believe that it is fair or right. So this is Cindy communicating to Robert Morris. Okay. You have had almost no consequences for your actions. I have suffered almost my entire life from the emotional damage you inflicted on me. If you want to know what I want, call me. Otherwise, I'll proceed with what has been advised. 23 years after you began destroying my life, I'm still dealing with the pain and damage you caused. I want some type of restitution. Pray about it and call me Cindy. So this is the email that Cindy uh, had sent to Robert Morris asking for restitution. She was going for therapy, so I think she needed some uh, help, uh, finances in that regard. So we had already shared this in the other program. Initially, she was asking 50000 and Morris and them promised that we can give you 25000 and she refused, and they wanted her to sign an NDA. So she refused to sign an NDA. They ended up not giving her the uh, 50000 So Robert Morris uh, responded to this email. Okay. Okay, so do we want to get that? Uh, so I have this one here. We can bring it up. Uh, I can show the original email, uh, in a little bit, but let's go ahead and bring this one up because this is the actual text of it and we'll draw that one up for you when we get it. All right. So this is the text from the email, uh, from Robert, right? Okay. So this was the October 3, 2005 one. Okay. So this, so now uh, Robert Morris is responding to Cindy, the email that I just read it to you. Mm -hmm. Cindy, Debbie and I really do care for you, and we sincerely want God's best for you. You see the blessings God has poured out on my life and conclude that it is because I have hidden my past. God does not work that way. He will not be mocked by deceit. I confess my sin to you and your family 18 years ago and have continued to share it with those who need to know as per the counsel of your father. I did what he asked me to do. I thought I obtained your forgiveness as well as your families. If you desire to make this public, I am also willing to do so. I would consult with your father first since he asked me not to share it publicly years ago. You should talk to your father also about disclosing this matter beyond those who already know since he has your best interests at heart and his counsel should at the least be considered if not honored. My attorney advised that if I pay you any money under a threat of exposure, you could be criminally prosecuted, and Debbie and I do not want that. If you need more information, have your attorney contact mine. The contact information is at the end of this email. Robert J. Shelby Sharp. So this was the email uh, Robert Morris 
responding to Cindy. Okay? Robert Morris even had the, the, the audacity, the nerve to actually quote the scripture and say that God is not mocked. Can you believe this guy? <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. I mean, just a tone of kind of a very standoffish tone to this email and almost like he's trying to, you know, just 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 put it on her and say, hey, look, man, like, let's just sort this out. You don't need to, you know, act out too much about this situation. Like it's, it just doesn't reek of it doesn't have any uh, aroma to me of a, a repentant and uh, a person who's really uh, heartbroken over what they did, responding to the actual victim of what they did of the person who suffered uh, these things, right? So they, they, he's responded to the victim in this manner, and you're just not seeing any brokenness over it by the tone of this email. Yes, so I'm seeing, uh, I don't know, I'm, I don't know if Cindy's father is still uh, is still alive. It seems like Morris every time brings up this card, but your father this, but your father this. And there is some hints, some notes over there of victim blaming for sure. I wonder if right now Morris is looking back, regretting like, man, if I had just paid her whatever she asked, I wouldn't have been in this situation where I'm at uh, right now today. So... Yeah, this is, you know, there is some complication of things over here because I'm sure eventually I seen the, because this was October in 2005, this incident took place in 1982. So I guess as she grew older, she realized, wait a minute, I need some help. What else can I do? Right. And he, uh, she ended up reaching to Robert Morris. I don't know if in 2005, at that point in Texas, uh, the statute of limitation had passed. And hence, she wasn't able to sue him. But, yeah, and here we are today. If you decide to make this public, I'm also willing to do so. <laughs> Was he really willing to make this public? I don't think so. I think this is one of those games you're playing with somebody like, hey, if you make this public, you know, everybody's going to know your business. Mm. I, it's It feels more like, like that, that to me, where it's like you're trying to play that game say, hey, man, you can come forward, but you know what's going to happen, right? Like everybody's no, going to know your business. And I would consult with your father since he asked me. So, again, now he's trying to say, yeah, but your dad mm -hmm. thought it was not a good idea to go public. But you're but if you want to do it, we can go that way. But so this is a mind game right here that he's playing with her in this email. But from from my estimation, from what I'm seeing here, this seems like uh it doesn't seem uh, sincere at all. Yeah, not only that, uh, as well as Robert, I said Debbie and I. So by Robert putting Debbie and I, according to the email, which means uh, Debbie, the wife, knew something about it. Now, did she know that uh, the age of Cindy was 12 years old? Who knows, right? So... This is a situation I'm sure none of those people will be speaking as far as their family is concerned. Looks like they're just going to let other people handle it. But the elder says they will let the investigation take place and then they're going to represent the findings to, to the congregation. So at some point we'll be able to hear who knew what, when and where. So, you know, we'll wait and see. And they say the investigation right now is ongoing, so the investigation has already started taking place. Other campuses and many watching online who have their own horrific abuse story. And I want to speak to you. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. I cannot imagine the pain and the emotions that this past week has stirred inside of you as you felt betrayed. And on behalf of the elders, we're sorry. This past week, the Board of Elders accepted the resignation of our senior pastor, Robert Morris. Our tagline at Gateway Church is, we're all about people. And you can't be all about people if you aren't committed to protecting people. We are committed to protecting people. First and foremost, children and the most vulnerable. Simply put, abuse in any form cannot be tolerated. And we as elders have the responsibility to do whatever it takes to learn the truth. And I want you to know that as your elders, we are deeply committed to walking in integrity and finding the truth. 
We moved quickly this week to hire an independent outside law firm to conduct a comprehensive and independent inquiry into this entire situation. The elders and you must know the facts and we must enforce accountability. Having this review completed by an independent outside organization is critical and we will report back to you once the work is complete. And please know that the Board of Elders is fully cooperating with this independent work which has already begun. And I ask that we all be patient while we give them time to do their work. Now I want to get very personal and I apologize if I get emotional. As I said before, I'm a father of six girls and this has been a difficult thing to explain to them this past week. And our family this past week, like all of you, has shed tears, had heavy conversations, and we've been in deep prayer. We've prayed for Cindy Clemenshire. We've prayed for her family. We've prayed for the entire Morris family. We're praying for you. And we're praying for our staff and our whole church family. Our family has been going to Gateway Church for 18 years. We go to Gateway Church not because of a building or a person. Our family goes to this church because we've seen the ward move here. All right, so the, can you see the church was packed to the capacity? I guess everybody wanted to hear, to see what exactly what their uh, elders are going to say, which is fine. He ended up uh, communicating. He shared that he also has little one, and I think everybody's just wondering what's going on. So, to you know, for the most part, I think the way they are handling this issue within their congregation, I think they are handling it well. Uh, I don't know how many people would decide, okay, you know, this is, if they decide like, okay, they're just going to leave or they're just going to stay, who knows. But, you know, the thing is like Robert Morris himself is no longer uh, in the ministry. He has resigned. Is he going to say anything? By now he would have said something. He hasn't. So I'm sure, you know, like they're always waiting for uh you know, like waiting for things to die down, right? That's when they'll be able to say something when things die down. So this is uh, where it's at. 